not possible to capture the heart and the spirit and the intelligence and the breadth of Tom Johnson. And so I'm not really going to try, except to tell you that Tom Johnson has been exceptional his entire life. Growing up in Macon, um, as I remember Tom going to Georgia on a newspaper scholarship from Peyton Anderson and the, Macon, the days of the Macon Telegraph, um, to what must have been his childhood in the Lyndon Johnson administration. You must have been 12 at the time, is that right? Um, to being a founder of CNN, the former president of the LA Times, a longtime ambassador for MD Anderson, and a longtime advocate for mental health services. In short, we are a very lucky town because Tom Johnson is here. He remains active in so many things. He takes big problems that would scare most of us and says, I will see what I can do about this. And that's what he is doing right now. And we are delighted and lucky to have him here today. You know, there are about, I guess, eight to 10 people uh, at uh, each of the tables. And just think about it. Not that long ago, about one in five of you, about one, maybe two people per table would have a family member who is significantly affected by addiction. Might just think of that. Today, one in three, one in three, and a dramatic rise is taking place, unfortunately, in our own community. What I saw, along with several others who are here today, was, you know, what can we do? What can we, members of what I think is the finest Rotary Club in America, but what can we do ourselves in our own way? I want to thank Jim for his introduction. I want to thank Jim for the splendid leadership of the Georgia Prevention Project. I won't tell you that he's a graduate of the University of Georgia and Harvard Business School, and I've known him for quite some time. Since information on the two speakers uh, was distributed to you earlier, I'll just emphasize that they are two of the nation's leading authorities on addiction. But one person I do want to introduce that was not introduced is the relatively new chairman of the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology at Emory University and have him stand, Bill McDonald. Bill? Five years ago, Dr. Justine Welch and William Cope Moyers were instrumental in the creation of a new Addiction Alliance of Georgia designed to serve every county in the state. Atlanta community leaders, especially Mohawk, then Chief Financial Officer, Frank Boykin, stand Frank, just so they can see you. <laughs> Named by the uh, Business Chronicle as the outstanding chief financial officer in the region not long ago. Also, international attorney, and probably, I think, the most remarkable person that I know who successfully is working on homelessness in this community, and that's Jack Harden. Jack, please stand. <laughs> they and others join with an aging, retired chief executive officer of CNN to determine, to determine what we could do about the surging crisis of addiction in Atlanta we determined after much research that Hazelton Betty Ford achieves the best results with emphasis on results of all the treatment centers in the nation. We reached out, first call to William Moyers, my friend, my protege, almost my son, 
And over these past four years, we have worked with the help of many of you in this room, many of you donors. I see several of you for, for which I am grateful for those early moments. But in any case, there was a recent ribbon cutting in renovated space at Wesley Woods. We are now open for outpatient, for intensive outpatient and telemedicine services. Our goal simply is to build what will become the premier center for addiction prevention, research, education, treatment, and recovery. And to tell you more, please welcome Dr. Justine Welch. Justine. All right, so good afternoon and thank you for having me. I'm here to talk about a topic that I think impacts every person in this room in some way. But before I do, I want to express my sincere appreciation for Rotary, both for letting me share my message, but also for the work that you do. It was a local Rotary Club in Struthers, Ohio in 1972 who brought my own mother from rural Australia here as a US foreign exchange student. She desperately wanted to obtain an education and see what else there was in the world. By doing so, she met my father, who was the son of the Rotary president and part of her host family. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> she was able to stay in the US and get her PhD. So I would just like to say thanks to you all for what you do. You never know how it's going to impact the world for generations to come. I'm also hoping that my being here today may bring meaning and promote positive change for the future. There is a high likelihood that addiction has affected each one of you in some way, whether you know it or not, either from personal experience or that of a loved one, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, an employee or coworker. In fact, nearly one in three people will develop a substance use disorder at some point in their lifetime. Here in Georgia, more people now die of drug overdoses than car accidents. To put that in perspective, we should be focusing on our children leaving the household with naloxone, an overdose reversal agent, just as much as we do them wearing their seatbelts. Over 100,000 individuals lost their lives to drug overdose in the US last year alone. But what I think largely goes unrecognized is that each year over 140,000 people die because of alcohol-related complications. People hear of a drug overdose and they suspect that the person was intentionally using opioids. But there's a growing trend of overdoses related to unintentional and unknown exposure to opioids, specifically a highly potent synthetic opioid named fentanyl. I've had patients as young as 15 years old overdosing on fentanyl. I've seen overdoses where people don't even realize that they're taking opioids, that they thought they were just using cannabis and unbeknownst to them, it was laced with fentanyl. One of the worst parts of my job is sitting with parents after they've lost their child to an overdose. I see their pain, their suffering, and sometimes their remorse. But what I also can see is shame. The shame that comes from the public perception that addiction is a choice. I would like people to know that addiction is a chronic brain disease, not a desired lifestyle. This belief that people simply choose to continue to use substances when they're addicted is where much of the stigma comes from. With addiction, there's a prolonged course of illness that may lead to other medical complications, and many people require long-term care. There are also functional and structural changes to the brain as a result of substance use. These are the hallmark criteria of a chronic disease. 
The impact of addiction is also experienced not only by those who suffer from the disorder, but families, communities, and Georgian employers. Lost work productivity from substance use costs the US economy billions of dollars each year and is a significant contributor to unemployment and staff turnover. Every dollar spent on addiction treatment saves $4 in healthcare costs and $7 in criminal justice costs. Four of the industries with the highest rates of workers with untreated substance use disorders, nearly twice the national average, are also some of the most impacted industries from the pandemic and include entertainment, recreation, food service, and construction. Employers accrue significantly greater costs from employees with active substance use, secondary to missed days at work, rates of turnover, and avoidable healthcare utilization. Compared to workers with untreated substance use disorders, those in active recovery have less turnover and unscheduled leave. Addiction is also a leading driver of unemployment, homelessness, and disability. According to reports from the LA Department of Public Health, the leading cause of death since 2017 has been due to overdoses among homeless adults. An annual estimate suggests that 30% or more of people experiencing homelessness in, here in Atlanta are also suffering from addiction. There is a significant need for additional services in our state that leverage and acknowledge the expertise and the resilience of Georgians and the knowledge of our own community's needs. Unfortunately, there are simply not enough addiction treatment providers and resources. And for the few individuals who may be able to access care, there are often significant barriers, like distance to a treatment center or affordability of that care, as well as stigma the stigma that's often associated with having a substance use disorder diagnosis. In fact, only one in 10 people with a substance use disorder receives specialty care each year. As a result of a growing need for a comprehensive approach, local community members came together and under the direction of volunteers and business leaders like Tom Johnson, Frank Boykin, Jack Harden, they helped Emory in the nation's largest nonprofit addiction treatment provider, the Hazleton Betty Ford Foundation, come together to form the Addiction Alliance of Georgia. The Addiction Alliance of Georgia is approaching the problem in three ways, through clinical programming, research, and education. The collaboration is working to create new models of care to meet the needs of Georgians, whether they live in metro Atlanta or rural parts of the state. Not only is the treatment offered in person, but it's also virtual so that we extend the reach of our services. Our multidisciplinary treatment team now consists of over 20 clinical staff from board certified addiction psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, and patient care co coordinators. We are on track to serving nearly 8,000 individuals in our first five years. The Addiction Alliance of Georgia is also focused on education and outreach, which enables us to impact lives and healthcare in ways beyond the treatment that we can provide. In partnering with the state, we've been educating community service boards on reducing stigma and how to effectively utilize medications for addiction treatment, which is not common practice. We've also created immersive educational experiences for a variety of learners, including medical, nursing, school of public health students from universities across the state. And while we've been able to accomplish a great deal in the last few years, we still have a very, very long way to go. There are ways each person here can help, such as by supporting local programs aimed at prevention, early intervention, treatment, and recovery. By fighting against the stigma of addiction and supporting individuals seeking help by advocating for legislative change at the state level to ensure that services for substance use disorder treatment and recovery are prioritized. 
to covering substance-related benefits in your own organizations. And finally, to obtain naloxone, the opioid overdose reversal agent, which is available at pharmacies across the state without a prescription. And make sure that your children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews not only wear their seatbelts, but carry naloxone in case they or someone they know encounter someone who's overdosed. I now have the great honor of turning the stage over to someone who I met in the very beginning of the planning of the Addiction Alliance of Georgia, Mr. William Cope Moyers. It's been fun, it's been meaningful, all at the same time, and I'm really happy we're on the same team. So, William, podium's yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Welsh, for all that you and Dr. McDonald and your team at the Addiction Alliance of Georgia do for so many people in this state, people who are just like me. I find it remarkable that I have the opportunity to be here today, not just sharing the podium with Dr. Welsh, but sharing an important conversation in this city, with this gathering of Rotarians and guests and my colleagues from Emory and also Hazel and Betty Ford, two of my colleagues, Matt Coleman and Kelly Geiser down here at the front table. Raise your hands if you have any questions about resources. Kelly and Matt can help you with that. Um, to be with all of you today, I find it remarkable and I also find it a stirring coincidence because you see in my long career, as a public advocate for Hazel and Betty Ford, I have given thousands of talks and presentations. But the very first public talk I ever gave was at a Rotary Club in St. Paul, Minnesota, 26 years ago this month, January 1997. I was the speaker that day for two reasons. One, I was a Rotarian, a member of that Rotary Club in St. Paul. And if you've ever served on the program committee and it's your responsibility to find the speakers, David, well, the first place you look is among the ranks of the membership. And there I was, the low hanging fruit. Because not only was I a local Rotarian in that club, but I worked at Hazelden, as we were then known at the time, a renowned nonprofit organization that treats people addicted to alcohol and other drugs. With a mission, an organization with a mission that reaches from coast to coast, but with its deepest roots in Minnesota, where we were founded in 1949. And what those Rotarians wanted me to talk about that day was the impact of alcoholism and drug addiction, a substance use disorder, in the workplace. Bingo! It's me, the expert from Hazelden, the fellow Rotarian, and the speaker that day. Well, I spent weeks preparing for that talk. I probably wrote three or four drafts. Remember, it was going to be my first speech. And I did a lot of research and found the most compelling statistics about how addiction affects employers and employees and their families and the bottom line. Some of those same statistics that Dr. Welch cited today. I also had some compelling statistics to make my case about how health plans should cover addiction among employees because treatment works and recovery benefits everyone and indeed bolsters the bottom line, whether you're a Fortune 50 company or small independent business. Everybody benefits when people get treatment. I practiced that speech in front of a mirror a lot. I even brought a new sports coat and tie for the occasion. And on that day of my speech in January of 1997, I made sure to well wear on my lapel my Hazelden logo pen on one side and my rotary pen on the other, noticing that I'm not wearing either one of those today. 
I was dressed for success. I had a speech ready to knock them dead. And just to make sure that I had hooked the audience right out of the gate, at the beginning of my talk that day, I told them how important Rotary was, not just to me, but in the same spirit, Dr. Welsh, as how you talked about it with your own family, how Rotary was, Rotary was important in my life. Because you see, my father, the journalist Bill Moyers, before he was a journalist, and before he was Lyndon Johnson's chief of staff, and before he helped to set up the Peace Corps under President Kennedy, and before he was an ordained Southern Baptist minister, my father was an international Rotary scholar in 1956. And coming out of a little town in East Texas, Marshall, as my father told me this morning when I told him I was going to be here, he said, you remind those Rotarians about how Rotary opened me to the possibility of everything that I was to achieve. So, I had that Rotary Club in the palm of my hand that day. How could I go wrong? But five minutes into my talk, I realized I was in trouble. I was losing my audience. Why? Why weren't they paying attention to me, the Rotarian, at the stage? Well, as we know, the only thing, one of the things more difficult than giving a speech after dinner is giving a speech after lunch. And I was losing my audience because some of them were falling asleep after the lunch that day, which I'm sure was the rubber chicken. But I was losing my audience for another reason too. Do you know what it was? It was very fundamental as I was discovered. I was losing my audience because I wasn't telling them anything they didn't already know. To Dr. Welsh's point exactly, Tom, to your point too, addiction affects everybody. And those Rotarians that day in that club in Minnesota, they knew the problem of addiction, not just in the workplace, but in the emergency room, in broken families and in the criminal justice system, in homeless shelters and in schools. Alcohol and other drugs have caused society problems for centuries. I was the expert from Hazelden, yes, but so were they. Aren't we all? Indeed, addiction is and always has been the number one public health crisis in Minnesota and in Georgia and in the nation. So that day, giving my very first talk in that Rotary Club in my hometown of St. Paul, I wasn't telling those Rotarians anything they didn't already know. In that moment, my very first talk, I realized that if I was going to save the day, save my first public talk, then I needed to do something quite different. I had to talk to them, I had to explain to them, I had to prove to them with a perspective that went way beyond what any of them were expecting, beyond what any of them had probably heard before. And so on that day, I took my well-crafted speech that I had rehearsed for weeks, I put it to the side of the podium and I spoke not from the page. I spoke not from my head. But that day, I spoke from my heart and from my soul. On that day, I stood before those Rotarians and I said, I know about these issues because I'm an alcoholic. And I'm a drug addict. This is what one looks like in recovery. I told them that day that, I, that as a teenager, I experimented with marijuana and beer, and before I knew it, those substances had hijacked my brain and stolen my soul. I told them that day that even though I lacked for nothing growing up, emotionally, morally, financially, or spiritually, I had it all. But despite it all, I was proof that addiction does not discriminate. Indeed, as Dr. Welch said, said, fundamentally, it is a disease of the brain, and I have one of those brains. I told them that my addiction led me to the darkest and most desperate places, a crack house in Harlem, New York, in 1989, a crack house in St. Paul, Minnesota, in 1991, and in 1994, a crack house at the corner of Boulevard and Ponce de Leon Avenues, not very far from where we're sitting today in Atlanta. Indeed, I told them that addiction nearly killed me more than once. 
But I told them that I had been saved, saved by people who continued to love me, even though they hated what addiction had done to me, and they hated what I did under the influence. I told them that I was saved even though I had given up on myself and that I wanted to die. I told them that even though I wanted to die in that crack house at the corner of Boulevard and Ponce, people wanted me to live. The people here in Atlanta, in this community, including my family, my employer, CNN, my church, my doctor, my neighbors, my community, and especially this man right here, Tom Johnson. Thank you, Tom. Indeed, on that day of October the 12th of 1994, after I had been in multiple treatments between 1989 and 1994, I was given one more chance. <laughs> given one more chance more than once. And finally, that last chance in Atlanta in 1994, I was saved. Well, when I shared that talk that day in that Rotary Club, that very first talk, those Rotarians, they sat up. <laughs> A few of them woke up. <laughs> they were shocked. They were shocked. No speaker had ever shared such an intimate perspective in their Rotary meeting about addiction and recovery, and they were shocked too because of what others have talked about this, today, the stigma. Because I didn't look like what they expected. That day at that Rotary Club, I told them about how stigma surrounds addicts and alcoholics and is omnipotent. It is shaming and most of all, stigma can be deadly. And that, that day in, my, in that Rotary Club when I was losing that audience and decided to share my insides with the outsides is when I realized that the best way I could educate and convince the Rotarians in that room, the best way I could shatter that stigma was to come out, so to speak. I discovered that day the power of telling my story the power of smashing the stigma by putting a face and a voice, mine, not just to the problem of addiction, but to the solution of recovery. And ever since, I have been speaking out at Rotary Clubs and Chambers of Commerce, on college campuses and medical schools, churches, synagogues, and even a couple of mosques from Wall Street to Main Street, to corner offices and HR departments of Fortune 500 companies, in jails and prisons and homeless shelters. I've spoken out in stadiums and arenas, public libraries and private family offices. The Aspen Institute, the Nobel Conference, and the news media, and now I have spoken out to you, my fellow Rotarians here in Atlanta. Speaking out, yes, about the problem, the power of addiction but making sure to speak out too about the solution, treatment and the promise and possibility of recovery. Recovery made possible when we give people a chance or another chance or just one more chance to experience what I found here in Atlanta so long ago, hope, help, and healing. Not a week goes by that I don't pause to ponder that day so long ago when this community did for me what I could not do for myself. And when I think about that day, October the 12th of 1994, less than a mile from where we are today, when I think about that day, I remember too all the other people who were in that crack house. There were nine of us in that crack house that day. But when the knock came on the door and I heard a command, we want the white guy, just the white guy, I knew that the two Fulton County Sheriff's Department, deputy sheriffs who were on the other side of that door, they were only looking for one person. One person that they were willing to pluck from the abyss of despair 
disaster and death and take to a treatment center up in Smyrna. All these years later, that one person of those nine people in that crack house, all these years later, of those nine people, only one of us is alive. The guy who got one more chance. That's why when Tom called me out of the blue five years ago this month and said, we need more treatment for people in Atlanta, instantly I saw the faces of those eight women and men who I left behind in that crack house so long ago, people who were just as sick as I was, people who were no different than me, except for two things. One, the color of their skin, and two, the fact, the harsh fact, that they were not going to get one more chance. It is for people like them that Hazel and Betty Ford and Emery came together it is for people like them that the Addiction Alliance of Georgia makes a difference every day since we cut the ribbon back in October. It is for people like them that we raised $10 million from this community to open the outpatient at Wesley Wood and why we will continue to raise more money from our dinner, generous donors to expand the mission of the Addiction Alliance of Georgia. And it is for people like those other women and men in that crack house. It's those people who motivate me to stand up and speak out and be here today with Dr. McDonald and Dr. Welsh and Tom and Frank and Jack and Matt and Kelly and all of you. It is for those people in that crack house who never got that chance that I'm here to be with you today. Thank you for being part of my journey, one day at a time. So we have time for a few questions from the audience. Bill. Thank you, President Stephanie. Last week, NPR did a fascinating story about the dearth of therapists in behavioral and mental health. And they introduced the concept of a chatbot using artificial intelligence and machine learning. What do you think? Is it hype or is it real? That's a great question. <laughs> Maybe I'll have a good answer. <laughs> I, I think in moments of despair, anything can help. Um, I, I have a preference for that personal connection, and I, I think that what we describe as the therapeutic alliance just can take, take someone so far. Um, here in Georgia, we do have a warm line, so CARES warm line. If anybody is uh, at risk of returning to substance use or looking for help, they can call this warm line and actually speak to a peer, someone with lived experience in recovery. So until I get more data on those chat boxes, I might refer them to that resource. But new future. <laughs> Chloe, I know you have a question. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, that made such a difference, just in terms of, like you said, just being able to give us all a wake-up call. As a parent of teenagers, um, there were two quick questions. One is, you talked about how it was a disease of the brain, not a choice. So. Kids all the time, they, in, you know, these little circles, they experiment with all of these things. What, what, um, what would you say to your younger self? And then what is the, um, the name of that drug that you said we should make sure we have at home? I didn't get a chance to write it down in case someone they know or someone, you know, gets um, subjected to a potential overdose. Okay, so just to, to start that, that's naloxone, and that's the generic version. It's also known as Narcan, 
and it's an intranasal spray that you can get at any pharmacy. There's a standing order at the state level for pharmacies to be able to distribute it without a prescription here in Georgia. There's so, also no penalty for administering, which is really important. If you're absolutely. a bystander, you shouldn't hesitate if you have access to Narcan to administer it because you cannot be penalized for that. Absolutely. There's an amnesty law here in Georgia. So if anybody has any illicit substances in the area, nobody will be arrested, which used to be a, a significant fear for people to call 911. Um, and then the other part about the experimentation, we do know, science tells us, that every year you delay the onset of use dramatically reduces the likelihood that someone is going to develop addiction or substance use disorder. So the longer they can hold off, the better for brain development, for reducing that risk. So clear, consistent messaging. Um, but I also work in child psychiatry and harm reduction is important. And so if they're going to be using, how do you reduce the risks associated with that? And that's a lot of the approach we take. And if I could just add, um, to Dr. Welsh's point, the longer we can wait, or encourage young people not to experiment, the greater their chances to grow up to be resilient because the brain is the last organ in the body that develops. And we know where substances go when we ingest them. They ultimately end up in the brain where decisions are made and risk is weighed. That said, um, my children are the product of two alcoholic parents, not just me in recovery, but their mother. So their risk of becoming um, uh, dependent on substances was much higher than perhaps the rest of the general population. I don't know what the statistic is, but it's much higher because they are the product of two alcoholic parents. My children never, two of my boys were born here in Atlanta. My children never saw their parents use because um, we were sober. And when I had my recurrence of use my, in 1994, my, ch my boys were too little to remember it. So they grew up with resiliently sober parents. And I said to my children, I want you to wait until you're 21 to experiment, if you choose to experiment for precisely this reason. And I said, if you'll wait till you're 21, I'll buy you a new car. Well, I don't owe any of my three children a new car. Yeah, they all experimented. Which is why, thank goodness, and I want to leave this with you, we need to give our children one more tool in their toolbox that they learn at school or from their parents or their grandparents, which is that if they choose to use, they may not be able to choose the outcome. In which case, if they choose to use and develop a problem, it's okay to come to your dad and ask for help. And two of my three children have come to me and asked for help in the last 10 years. I gave them permission to do that. And I think it's really important that if you leave here today with any message as a parent or a grandparent, it's that you encourage that loved one of yours to come and ask for help should they develop a, an issue, because there is help out there. Bill? I know, I know that a good many, if not most, of the independent schools in the Atlanta area do random drug testing on their high school populations. Um, is random drug testing a possibility for public schools? Yeah, so that I'd actually be interested to hear what Jim Langford's <laughs> opinion is on this. There, there's mixed data to support random drug testing at schools. And so my cent or the center that I work at, we do a lot of evaluations for some of the local private schools where students have tested positive on screens and then they need to be assessed by a clinician before they're allowed back into, you know, the classroom. And it, I would say personally it, it has kind of mixed effects where you're, you're more likely to detect some types of substances and not others. And really I'm more concerned about the functional impairment. Are they struggling in school? Are they de developing mood symptoms, symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of depression? I am more interested in that versus one random screen that was positive for cannabis or THC. And so that's just from my perspective. So one of the things that you touched on was about family members coming forward, but we have a lot of employers in the audience. So how do you, and a lot of them have zero tolerance, tolerance policies. How do you encourage employees to open up if they're struggling, and then what do you do about it as an employer? Outstanding question. Uh, so 
Random drug testing can be an effective tool to provide safety in the workplace, protect the bottom line, and all those other reasons why you might test somebody. But testing for the sake of just testing is not the answer if, if you're just simply going to terminate that employee. Um, to Dr. Welsh's point, when people in, find recovery, they benefit the bottom line. Uh, and that treatment is a good investment in a company's business model. So I would encourage, if you're going to have random testing in schools or in the workplace, make sure you have policies in place to help people who test positive, number one. Number two, all, all companies should make sure that their health plans cover mental illness and substance use like they cover any other major chronic illness. That is the law in the country, but it's unevenly applied. Thirdly, it's good to have this kind of dialogue today in the workplace, whether it's driven by HR or by their employees in the workplace that are in recovery or themselves. It, it, we, and then fourthly, what are we testing for? Because while opiates are deadly, while methamphetamine is what it is and crack cocaine, alcohol continues to be the most used and abused drug in the world. And what good is it to test somebody for methamphetamines or marijuana, which is being legalized across the country, if we're not also going to test them for other dangerous substances and then have a plan for treating them if they need help? We have one last question. African Americans, if, if I'm for legalization of marijuana, if if not for anything else, the disparate treatment African Americans in in particular, and and poor African Americans whose lives have been criminalized, if you will. But one thing that I have noticed is in popular culture, is that as marijuana has been somewhat stream, uh, mainstreamed, it's almost glamorized now. That it is a no harm drug that senior citizens use, teenagers use, and everybody in between. Does that give you some concern about uh, what the long-term, even maybe even short-term effects of this no harm drug that's now sort of inundating places throughout the country? And that is very well said. I am 100% for decriminalization because of exactly what you described. There's so many things wrong with the system. At the same time, the states that are fully legalizing cannabis, you're not seeing a dramatic increase in the number of people who use, but you're seeing a dramatic increase in the frequency of use, so how often people are using, because it's more accessible. Then you're also seeing an increase of the potency of the products. So loose leaf kind of cannabis from the actual flower or plant, you're thinking is about 13% THC. The patients I'm treating, the 14 to 26 year olds, they're using 90% THC concentrates. And those, th that, that's a different substance than that 13% flower. I'm seeing increased rates of psychosis after one episode of use. I'm seeing long-term health effects, cognitive impairments, issues with being able to just function because of the potency of these products. And there is a marketing towards younger individuals. So you will see the, the um, packaging, you know, it, it, they're gummy bears. And in addition, the unintentional um, ingestion by pediatric patients, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, has dramatically gone up across the country because they're viewing this as candy. So I, I think there needs to be greater regulation around the packaging, the products, what we're doing with these. Yeah, absolutely. Stephanie, just the last thing, if I could add, and we have to go. Um, is that we always at Hazel and Betty Ford and through the Addiction Alliance of Georgia love to give a call to action to groups that we are in front of. And you all are getting ready to disperse back into the community. Every one of you is an influential person in some way, shape, or form in your communities. And so what, what Dr. Welsh and I would ask you all to do is that when you leave this Rotary Club as we close now, take something that you heard today and share it with somebody who wasn't here. However you decide to do it, it may be at your church or your synagogue or a book club or a yoga club or, or at the doctor's office or wherever, but, or in the news media. And it was good to see Maria here. Maria Supporta, thank you for all your good work with the Addiction Alliance of Georgia and publicizing us. But take something that you heard and take it back and give it to somebody in your sphere of influence who wasn't here today. 
John Maxwell said that uh, true leadership isn't about profit margins and spreadsheets and growth charts. It's about your ability to influence others. And we all have the opportunity in this room to influence others about this topic. So I want to thank our speakers today for sharing your personal journeys as well as your professional ones on such an important topic. Thank you.